Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's time for my, uh, well, semi-regular news roundup, deep space updates. I myself, I'm actually going to be getting on a plane really soon, so I'm going to knock this out fast. Hoping to get to uh, the Intrepid in New York if uh, the stars align, but yes, we're going to start uh, with the launches that we've had in the last, uh, I don't know, eight, eight days maybe? And honestly, it's actually been rather quiet. We've had, in March 22nd, there was a Soyuz carrying a you know, with Fregat upper stage launching a Meridian 10. So Meridian, I believe, is a Russian communication sat uh, sat satellites that are used for military. So they sit in these like highly inclined Molniya orbits on 12-hour cycles. And uh, yeah, you know, they, they have to have a certain number to maintain continuous coverage. And obviously, continuous communication coverage for uh, Russian military assets is something they're quite interested in right now, given they have actually had some of their Meridian satellites fail. Uh, yeah. Um, on the 29th of March, we had the maiden flight of the Long March 6A. So this is a step up from the Long March 6. So the Long March 6 is a small... Um, cryogenically fueled, you know, liquid hard, uh, liquid oxygen and RP-1, the two-stage rocket that has been sort of small launch or, you know, I think it's like roughly equivalent to like a Soyuz in terms of its uh, launch capability. Uh, the 6A basically doubles the number of engines on the first stage. It adds solid rocket motors. This is the first Chinese rocket to actually use solid rockets, uh, strap on solid rocket motors. Um, and this is a, supposedly about a 500 ton rocket able to put four and a half tons into low Earth orbit. And so this particular launch, they included a set of Earth observation satellites that went into sun-synchronous orbit. Finally, on the 30th of March, we saw the Long March 11, which is a four-stage solid rocket motor, and it had three satellites that are doing like radio calibration, I believe. But this morning... It wasn't an orbital launch, but it is worth mentioning that Blue Origin, or Blorg as some people like to call them, uh, they made their uh, New Shepard launch with their six space tourists, including the, the kitchen guy, the guy kitchen who had been to every single other country, and now he's been to a place which doesn't have any countries, i.e. space. Yes, it would be nice if uh, there were no borders in space. Uh, yeah, that's great. More interestingly, on the Blue Origin front, there was a... Like, there was a conference or something recently, and the subject, and, you know, um, Tori Bruno was there, and a number of other people from Blue Origin, and the subject of the BE-4 engine delivery came up, and it's confirmed that they are pretty sure that they are getting their engines before the middle of the year, and that they should be ready to launch Vulcan by the end of the year. Blue Origin, in testing the BE-4, they revealed that they have had over five hours of runtime on BE-4 engines of various sorts. So, I am I think, you know, it works. It's a question of making sure they can build it for the price that they're selling it for. The, it does sound that, uh, like, New Glenn is definitely not going to happen this year, but maybe 2023. You never know. M of course, with all the launches going on being sort of meh, what people were far more interested in was the return to Earth of Mark van der Hey and uh, his buddies on the Soyuz, which uh, happened a couple of nights ago. It was all, you know, very carefully curated, NASA broadcast and Russian broadcast. Everybody was exceptionally happy. Um, by the way, apparently Dmitry Rogozin's latest ultimatum expired today, so I don't know if he's going to like actually do anything or if it was, well, like most of his threats, rather empty. But yeah, um, so Mark van der Hey, the uh, departed the, the International Space Station, landed in Kazakhstan, everybody was smiles, and then they went their separate ways. Mark took a, you know, little Learjet or something. I don't know what it was. He, he took a jet through Azerbaijan and into Germany and he uh, just landed today in the, the US. So that's great. As for replacing or as for sending up new crew, we now have uh, a new date on crew four is going to be 420. They are going to be getting high April 20th. It'll be a five day handover with crew three. Between now and then, there is going to be the Axiom 1 launch with the three space tourists and the astronaut from the Axiom company. Um, 
that is April 6th. This got pushed back a bit. Originally, it was going to be like on the end of March, but they pushed it back because SLS is doing its wet dress rehearsal like tomorrow. They're going to be filling that sucker up with liquid hydrogen and, you know, checking that everything works, going through all the motions to verify that they are ready to launch this big candle. It's going to be exciting. Well, hopefully the dress rehearsal is totally boring and nothing happens. But the launch, that's going to be exciting. Uh, anyway, so that is going to, because that is on the pad next to where SpaceX launches their uh, rockets, obviously SpaceX can't be doing a human launch during that wet dress rehearsal. SpaceX also, by the way, have announced that they are stopping building the Crew Dragon spacecraft. They have four of them that are currently operating. They will continue to leave the production lines in place because they want to be able to build spare parts to maintain and keep these in circulation. But, you know, the US worked just fine with four space shuttles. I imagine that SpaceX can meet their demands using just four Dragon spacecraft. And if necessary, if the demand is there, I'm sure they can build more. But the SpaceX are definitely focusing more on Starship. That is the official line. And last week as well, OneWeb has surprised exactly nobody when they announced that they are switching away from the Soyuz launch vehicle and have signed a deal with SpaceX to launch their satellites on the Falcon 9. So that means the two major communications cluster in low orbit are now going to have most of their, many of their satellites launched on a Falcon 9. Uh, there was news as well that Intelsat are now selling to customers a combined satellite service package. So Intelsat, they operate satellite internet via these satellites in geostationary orbit. And that's only so good. There's problems with like, you know, communications density and lag. Low Earth orbit improves on a lot of those things. So they're selling now a combined package where the users get a sort of a box that will transparently connect to the satellites in low Earth orbit, Starlink, and they will also connect to geostationary satellites and they'll magically switch back and forth. They actually demoed this like last year using OneWeb, but obviously Starlink is a far more mature constellation at this point and uh, has been battle tested. So that's what they're doing. Anyway, um, yes, the really, 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 really big news, and I mean big as in billions of dollars big, is the, the White House has basically published their planned budget for NASA. Now, this is the what the White House wants. It is a blueprint based upon what NASA has asked for and what the president thinks it should get. It's not necessarily what's going to happen because, of course, that has to go through Congress. It has to go through the House and the Senate. And eventually you'll have a budget that pops out never in time because this budget is supposed to start in October of 2022. And we're only just getting the October 2021 budget signed and organized. But yeah, this uh, budget from the White House, it is an 11.6% increase overall. $25.9 billion. It's, of course, still very small compared to, you know, the defense budget. But it's nice to see space getting more of it. The, the human landing system gets a big bump from $1.2 billion to $1.5 billion. And that will cover the development of Lunar Starship going forward. And also, formerly, NASA is looking for the next step. Uh, so they're going to be buying at least one more human landing launch from, uh, you know, from uh, SpaceX, but they're looking for another supplier. So this gives, you know, Blue Origin or the national team, it gives Dynetics, possibly Boeing, another chance to get in the race, but not Vivace because they were never seriously in the running. You know, sorry, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, um, what else? Science programs get a boost, decent amount, but it, it's not perfect. Like there's, it's not like the Artemis program is the big budget thing and they're getting all the money. They're getting a little, NASA is going to, is getting promised a little more money uh, to keep their science programs going. But you know, Europa Clipper right now is this beast inside NASA that has a lot of political support and is needing a lot of money. And it's basically taking money away from other things. I've heard that like NEO Surveyor has had its launch pushed back due to like money issues and yeah. But anyway, yeah, Europa Clipper and uh, so on and so forth. Oh, spacesuit development. Because, of course, we <laughs> those spacesuits that are being used on the space station are getting rather old and we really need some new spacesuits that actually will work. Um, in fact, 
In the last week, on the last EVA, one of the astronauts ended up getting water in their helmet again. And having that happen once is pretty scary. Having it happen twice after the problem is understood is utterly terrifying. And I really hope that we get the spacesuits figured out. Um, on the sort of political front, once again, the FAA has again deferred their judgment on the Boca Chica Starship launch review to another month or so. Many individual, we're now starting to see uh, like the Mars Society and various other, you know, organizations that promote space use telling the FAA to sort of get their stuff in order and, you know, please review and please support this. And also, Elon has confirmed that, as I mentioned, or as I suspected previously, 420 is not getting high. So yeah, Booster 4, Starship 20 are not going to be doing the orbital flight anymore. Too much has changed. There have been you know, too many problems and shortcomings that have been found in the design, which have been remedied in future ones. And the smart money is currently on Booster 7 and Ship 24 to actually make the flight to orbit when they're ready and when the review says that they are allowed to do this. Uh, okay, so on the space science front, the Hubble Space Telescope made a bold announcement. Oh, the well, okay, scientists using the Hubble Space Telescope made a bold announcement claiming to have found the most distant star ever individually resolved. Now, let's be clear. You can look out and see galaxies going very, very far back. But resolving individual stars is hard because they're so far and small and there's all these other stars next to them, right? So their claim is that they have found a highly magnified star at a redshift of 6.2. That is actually, that is literally the title of the paper they published in Nature. That would make this a star that formed about 900 million years after the Big Bang. This isn't in the very first population of stars. This is like, because these very big stars, this has to be a big star, like 50 solar masses to make it bright enough. Um, they, there has to have been a generation of stars before this one because these things only last a few million years before they go supernova because they're so big, they burn fuel so quickly. Um, but anyway, even although it is a big star, it still would merge into the background if it wasn't for gravitational lensing. So there is a cluster nearby and it forms this sort of magnification region and this star just happens to land in exactly the right place to have itself magnified by a huge factor. So like they've previously found stars with redshift of 1.5. So just for those that don't you you don't know uh, the higher the redshift the faster it is leaving you're know, traveling away from us therefore the further away it is in the universe assuming the cosmological distance ladder holds up over cosmological scales. Um, so yeah, 1.5 is a long way away. 6.2 is, yeah, yes, many, many, many times further away. For, you know, for comparison, unlensed grav supernova, right? That is supernova, which are some of the brightest events in the universe. Without gravitational lensing, they have been seen at redshifts of up to four. So finding a star that is, you know, lensed enough to make it bright enough. This is essentially gravitational forces focusing the light to make the object brighter. That is uh, unheard for. And honestly, like, I'm totally, I would not be surprised if some other explanation for this is found. But anyway, it does sound pretty cool. Also, by the way, it's named uh, Urindel, which is... Well, they say it is an old English word for a star of, or named star, but real nerds will point out it's very specifically a star which is referenced in Lord of the Rings by Galadriel. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, what can I say? Astronomers, there are a bunch of nerds. I know. Other, another astronomy thing that sort of made it into the news in the last week is talk of volcanoes on Pluto. Now... When New uh, Horizons flew past Pluto back in 2015, um, obviously they got all this really cool data. I actually talked to one of the team. I did like an interview and they, you know, they gave me someone called Kelsey Singer. Well, she's published this paper on cryovolcanism and there are evidence that makes them think that they have identified cryovolcanoes that are very possibly still active because they don't look like they've collapsed into a caldera. 
So they have like a right mons and Picard mons, and they point out that right mons is comparable in size to Mauna Loa, which is one of the largest volcanoes on Earth. But Pluto has a radius or diameter which is like five times smaller than Earth. So this is a monster, monster cryovolcano. Pluto, of course, is out on the very edge of the solar system. And instead of rocks, ice, water ice becomes a rock. You know, when you're, when you're doing planetary science, you have to start thinking about ice as a mineral, right? It really gets so cold, it becomes solid. It becomes part of the geology. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is a sort of really interesting thing to see. We've seen cryovolcanism on places like Europa, Enceladus, and even out on Triton. I think Triton was the first place we we definitely saw cryovolcanism, but those were very small, like geysers. This is huge volcanic structures uh, because I think that you know the object Pluto is a whole lot bigger, and yeah, definitely interesting. I'm going to have to like learn a little more about this, but I do find uh, these sort of outer solar system places to be quite fascinating. And uh, yeah, one final news is that uh, Mercury-based uh, electro, electro, ele uh, electronic, no, Mercury-based electric propulsion, uh, they've actually signed like a, you know, the part of the, into the Minamata Convention on Mercury pollution or whatever. They basically banned Mercury, you know, thrusters that use mercury in their propulsion in low earth orbit. Uh, and the story goes that there was uh, you know, various companies trying to you know, sell this technology at some point and nobody was biting, but it was realized that, you know, if you've got a satellite with several hundred kilograms and you have a mega constellation with thousands of satellites, then that's hundreds of tons of mercury going into the upper atmosphere. And while it is nothing compared to the amount of mercury dumped by traditional fossil fuels, it's just good to have that not happen. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I saw a lot of responses to that, which seem to be full of people who think that Starlink is somehow propelled by mercury thrusters. And that is completely bogus. This is getting misreported a lot. Uh, Starlink uses the Krypton uh, thrusters, which are, well, a little more expensive, little, uh, well, they, they don't get as much thrust, but uh, they get better specific impulse. But anyway, it is definitely benign and inert as they come. So yeah, that is my selection of news. As I said, I'm going to be jumping on a plane really soon and uh, hope to make some videos while I'm on the road, or maybe I'll see something out there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.